Helen Rella is a member of Wilk Auslander's Global Practice Group, advising corporations, individuals, and governments conducting business in the U.S. and abroad. Helen has substantial experience in labor and employment law, representing both individual and corporate clients. She is an expert at developing and implementing appropriate personnel policies and procedures and defends clients against discrimination claims, as well as challenges in court and before the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, state and city divisions of human rights, and the U.S. Department of Labor. Welcome to the RiskAdvisor.com podcast. I'm Sal LaFury, and I'm here with my good friend and co-host, Jim Henry. So today's topic, we want to talk about returning to work after COVID-19, something that's in everybody's mind today. So Jim, over the last few months, we've both seen some serious innovations taking place with respect to technologies and how they're being implemented. You know, some of it's been really good, and some of it, I mean, as we joke about a lot of times, it's just downright stupid. Um, you know, me and you, we've seen all of this before, right? The World Trade Center bombings, the 9-11 attacks. And we see that the technology drive that came from all of that, and a lot of technology was really good. Now we have the COVID and we have legal implications that seem to be greater than ever. What do you think about what's happening now between the technology drive and the legal implications that are popping up? Well, you're right. We have seen this all before. And when you say... um you know, some of these implementations or ideas have been downright stupid. Um, that's from the perspective of the, of the practical application. Um, but when you look at the, at the people that are peddling these, um, may not be so stupid because, uh, you know, they're driven by blind uh, or mercenarily driven opportunism, I should say. And, uh, and you know, it's, it's, it's a vulnerable um, – clientele out there right now. They're very concerned. They're looking for a, a quick uh, solution. Uh, and some of these uh, ideas are, are very nicely packaged and presented generally uh, to the sea level uh, management uh, where, the, where the vulnerability is most, um, you know, is most, you know, of greatest concern. And it bypasses the, the normal vetting that would occur, you know, when you don't have an environment, you know, like, uh, like we have today. And, again, we had it post, uh, post 9-11 with a lot of the technologies that came out and a, and a lot of product and a lot of technology was bought. Um, but the implementation uh, did not meet the expectations that were created by the uh, artful salesmanship of, of, of those manufacturers. So. You know, hopefully we can get quickly past that and um, and be deploying solutions that, that truly, uh, uh, you know, reduce the risk and our, and our uh, you know, practical application of technology. Yeah, I think it's it, it, it kind of, you know, goes along with what we had been talking about earlier today when we were talking about the – how some of these technology companies that are creating these technologies are just jumping over to security director folk – and are going directly to the CEO, CFOs, and coming out with a shiny new toy and trying to get them to buy it. And the director level is getting this stuff down their throat, saying, you know, hey, here's a new toy, try and use this, you know, make this work. It's even worse when there's a relationship, when it's the guy's brother-in-law that's bringing it to bear. But, <laughs> yeah. but aside from that, um, you know, and, and we, we see this on almost, you know, a daily basis now in, in the consulting practice. So to talk about some of the, the legal complications about returning to work, we have with us today a, a special guest who also happens to be a close personal friend, and that's Helen Rella. Helen, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me join you here today on The Risk Advisor. I'm honored to be your guest. Uh, at the outset, I would like to say, of course, our discussion is in the context of information only, and this is not legal advice, and certainly anyone who has any questions pertaining to any of the subject matters that we discuss should seek the advice of independent, competent legal counsel. So probably the first thing that draws everybody, you know, when you think of an attorney, you think of the next topic and they come hand in hand is fear, right? So what are some of the employee fears or the, the, the employer fears or employee fears that you're hearing on a daily basis? What's the most common things that you're hearing today? 
Well, the element of fear really comes into play in the discussion relating to the coronavirus because that's the excuse that many employees are giving uh, in saying that they do not want to return to work. In fact, uh, what we've seen is that there are a lot of employees who are not going back to work and using that as a, as a justification. Unfortunately, fear is not a reasonable basis to uh, give an employer for not coming back when the employer says we are in accordance with uh, state guidelines opening our offices and we expect our workforce to come back. So the employee gets to set the terms and conditions of employment uh, the employer work is done. The employer. The employer sets the terms and conditions of employment. That's right. So, what happens if a person refuses to go to back to work? If or some, is making a claim? Does that become discrimination of some sort, or how if, does how does that all apply? If somebody refuses to return to work and they have not requested what, what's known in the law as a reasonable accommodation under the Americans with Disabilities Act, asserting that they have some sort of medical or physical, uh, mental or physical condition that um, uh, that prevents them from coming back to work, and they're granted an accommodation, absent that, uh, they uh, can be deemed to have resigned and their employment can be terminated. Does that impact, impact unemployment insurance? Yes, because if you quit your job, you're not entitled, generally speaking, to receive unemployment insurance. And, I mean, some of the topics that we've been hearing, some of the you know, stories we've been hearing, employers are having a very tough time getting employees back. Correct. Because of the unemployment insurance. Well, be- that's because there's a federal kicker of $600 on top of the uh, the rate that an employee would be entitled to receive uh, from, this, from their, their state, whichever state they're in. That's so, part of the CARES Act. Right. In some, some instances, what we have are situations where employees are making more money now per week collecting the, uh, the base unemployment rate that they get that's calculated in accordance with what their uh, pay level was, and in addition, receiving that $600. So that's a, that is a problem. That's a problem. In fact, we've, we saw employers who receive PPP loans who were unable to get their workforce back because those loans are largely predicated uh, on keeping the, the workforce intact. And so employers who laid off or furloughed their workers said, hey, come on back. We want to have you come back and we're going to pay you with this loan money that we've gotten which is a requirement for the loan forgiveness, we're put in a position where the employees are saying, sorry, we're not coming back because we're making more uh, now collecting unemployment insurance. That's why you hear on the federal level of uh, discussions uh, of potentially some sort of an incentive to get people to go back to work. So, Helen, uh, a number of employers now have um, have authorized or are permitting, uh, you know, their employees to, uh, to work from home. Um, and in some cases, there are some costs associated with setting up, uh, you know, to work from your home. Uh, what is the situation with regards to an employer's obligation to uh, compensate the employee for some of those expenses? There is no obligation for an employer to pick up the cost of a home office. So uh, employees certainly can engage in in interactive discussion with their employer, and what we're seeing is that employers are cognizant of the fact that some people might need assistance, and many employers have provided at the outset of the pandemic uh, employees with laptops, with cell phones, where their calls are routed from their office phones to uh, the cell phone so that they can continue to work. And employers uh, are, are trying to assist in that regard because it's in everybody's interest to have people working uh, cooperatively uh, together. But there is no affirmative obligation on the part of the employer to pick up those costs. Right. When we were talking about uh, fear initially and, and, and you know, what the position is of some employees with regards to resisting, uh, you know, coming back to work, um, you indicated that, uh, you know, reasonable accommodations, uh, they can make requests for reasonable accommodations in case they have uh, underlying medical conditions or whatnot. Can you elaborate on that as to truly what their rights are and what the, the employer's responsibilities are to accommodate them? 
Well, under the Americans with Disabilities Act, somebody that has a, a an actual condition, right, a physical or mental condition that, that impedes one or more basic life activities can make a request for a reasonable accommodation. But in, in fact, the request has to be reasonable, and it cannot subject the employer to undue financial hardship. If it does, that's a basis for the employer to deny the request. The request has to be considered in an even-handed, non-discriminatory mm. manner across the board. And in the case of, uh, of COVID-19, we are seeing people with comorbidities, which is that phrase that indicates you've got some sort of a, uh, of a condition where they deem you to be more at risk, and that includes being over 60, having a, a heart or lung problem, high blood pressure, you've heard the talk of obesity, all of those things are, are qualifying conditions uh, that would give an employee a basis to make a request for an accommodation. And uh, the employer, again, would then have to look at those requests uh, in an even-handed, non-discriminatory manner. I'm assuming you would suggest that both for the employer and the employee that these requests and the communication on the accommodations be done in writing between the two parties? Well, look, there always is a writing when there's an, when, uh, there's an accommodation request that's actually gone through in terms of medical documentation, uh, et cetera. But, but typically speaking, employers can, should feel free to speak with their, um, their uh, em- employees about these things when the employee comes to them and says, I would like to make this, this request. Because people need to work cooperatively together, particularly in this uh, situation where we're dealing with, with a, a pandemic and uh, situations that we haven't had to address before. Right. But even when it's a congenial relationship, it would, it, I think it would be beneficial for the employer to have the optics of showing that they're, they're dealing with these requests in an even-handed basis. Of course. Yeah. Of course. And everything is – we always recommend that everything be documented in the employment setting. And, and, you know, there's a whole series of paper, paperwork uh, that has to be completed. Is there like an arbiter that, that can be, or, an, you know, like a mediation or somebody in between? Because it, it appears the, 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 the employer has the ultimate say, and if the employee feels slighted, then the next step is legal action. Well, that's that's unfortunate. That's something that we don't like to see happen. Uh, in terms of whether there's an arbitration regarding a request, that that you would only come have that come into play if you had somebody that that had an employment contract that mandated that any type of dispute uh, be sent to arbitration, or if you're dealing, uh, for example, with a with a collective bargaining agreement uh, with union employees, and then there would be a whole host of procedures that would have to be uh, followed. But generally speaking, uh, accommodation requests go directly from the employee to the employer and uh, are addressed by the uh, by the employer. The, usually the first step is the human resources department of the employer. Sounds good. Okay. Well, I just want to remind the listeners that you're listening to the Risk Advisor podcast hosted by Jim Henry and me, Sal LaFreury. We're going to invite you to comment on our blog at theriskadvisor.com and to subscribe and follow us on our social media like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you're interested in having one or both of us speak at an upcoming event or you would like to consult with either one of us or both of us, please go to our webpage again at theriskadvisor.com and you can set that up. So, Helen, one of the things uh, I'd like to get into now is to talk a little bit about issues that we can anticipate employers are going to be facing in the terms of you know future claims that are going to come up, um, you know, there's a there's a whole liability, a whole list, a laundry list of things that potentially can happen. Um, one of which I think is gonna is gonna wind up playing, and I may be wrong, and you can tell me. Wrongful death. Somebody who's gotten COVID and who winds up dying from it. Um, what's the potential for those lawsuits to come back? You know, the problem that we have in this area, Sal, is that. There is no way to definitively prove where somebody contracted the virus. You know, people don't live in their office space, so the notion that you could make uh, make uh, make a claim that that you got this as a, at, at the workplace it, it does not seem uh, probable from a proof perspective. Generally, on-the-job injuries are covered by workers' compensation 
workers' compensation law deals with those types of claims, uh, and employees are limited to those to that uh, basis. Unfortunately, in this instance, we find that the workers' comp carriers have made it known that they are not going to be covering these types of claims, and that is, again, because there's no definitive proof as to where you contracted the the virus. Can people bring those claims? Do we think they'll bring those claims? People bring all sorts of claims against their their employer. Uh, I wouldn't anticipate that that's going to be the largest area. I think there's a greater likelihood that we're going to see uh, discrimination claims relative to accommodation requests that are denied. We also may see claims that pertain to those that were selected for layoff or termination, uh, claims that that was done on a discriminatory basis. There might be wage and hour claims for people who are hourly workers, not salaried, meaning that they're compensated on an hourly basis and that they're working from home and are not being adequately uh, compensated for overtime. Those are the types of claims that, that we we anticipate, but, you know, the, it's going to run the gamut. It largely depends uh, as to whether or not the, the legislature is going to um, pass some regulation that limits or prohibits the claims uh, under COVID-19. So we hear a lot about denial of leave. Um, that seems to be a very complicated issue, um, somewhat maybe under FMLA, um, but government saying, you know, the New York State at least was saying for a while, you can, if you don't feel good, you can stay home and you can't be charged against your time. Explain some of that or clear some of that lunacy up for us because th- some of it just is awfully confusing. Well, there are a whole host of regulations that uh, that were were passed um, on the federal level relative to uh, people who became ill with COVID-19. So an employer cannot terminate somebody if they're subject to an order of quarantine and they're, they have the uh, virus and they need to remain home. Uh, in addition, there are provisions under the law, under the Families First Act, that uh, that provide uh, for leave for people whose child care facilities or schools were closed. Uh, that That's mitigated now by the fact that we're now uh, in June and schools are already closed, so there's uh, there's not that, that issue that comes into, into play. How much does OSHA play into all of this? OSHA regulates hazards, right? It's a hazard occupational safety. We usually only saw OSHA getting involved in, in uh, workplace type claims. Uh, uh, an example that I can give is when you, you somebody who works at a chemical plant where, where there's a hazardous substance that's being um, that, that, that's being produced and, and uh, employees bring safety uh, related claims. That's that's a very good example. That's easily understandable. It, OSHA implications, uh, I think, are going to rise because the CDC regulations use use the word hazard hazard and uh, reference uh, an employer's duty uh, to prevent against it. So that's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. We we don't know because because the return to professional offices is really only just beginning, and so once that. Uh, once that moves forward and um, uh, the claims begin to be filed, which we anticipate they will be, we'll have a better understanding of uh, what laws people are going to be making the claims under. So we may see a correlation between those kinds of hazards in the workplace and maybe an employer that is that is you know not really adhering to the protocols that uh, the state and local governments are are enacting is is that an area where those claims actually um, may get some footing because you said earlier that it's difficult to prove where you got it but if you have an employer that is ignoring or not adhering those guidelines could it even carry to the point where you know you might even have a wrongful death claim as a result of uh I would say that anything can happen. It's yeah. it's fair game now. It's fair game. Because we've never had this experience before, we don't know what's going to happen, but it's certainly fair game. Hopefully it won't come to that. Look, nobody wants to see their employees uh, get sick, whether it's in, in the uh, 
workplace or otherwise, and I, I, employers are working together and using best efforts on a large part to try to ensure that their workplaces uh, are sick because it's in nobody's interest to have an employee um, be diagnosed with, uh, with the virus and then have to shut down the workplace and bring in sanitizing teams and have an instance where uh, other people in your work force were exposed to the virus and are now uh, taken out of commission and forced to quarantine for the mandatory 14-day period. One of the things that we've seen uh, in our consulting practice is that you have this switch that goes from secu- where security was, you know, making sure the doors were locked and people didn't gain access to it and you controlled access and watched video and that sort of stuff. To then it got to, you know, the health and safety. And for us, health and safety had always been, you know, the trip and falls and that sort of stuff. Today we're looking at where you have security getting more involved in the health and safety aspects of it and a more concern now with, you know, using hand sanitizers and wearing PPE. That seems to become problematic because we're asking an untrained staff to get involved in a medical component and so it's 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 sort of you know two sort of two ply is where I'm going with it one is you know what level of training or how much do how important is it to document at least the level of training that you're giving to employees with respect to you know making sure that you've covered all of your bases and then, you know, part two is, you know, and we touched on it briefly before about, you know, the cameras, the, you know, the thermal imaging cameras mm-hmm. and getting all of that data. When we're looking at that data, um, does HIPAA start to apply? The, the governmental protocols um, that we were discussing uh, mandate that, em, that employers train their employees in appropriate safety measures and that there are postings uh, that alert employees as to what's a- appropriate. And, it, and your point uh, is, is a very good one in that we're dealing in situations where we have people who are not, not security professionals, not, uh, not medical professionals, who are being asked to step outside of their comfort zone uh, and, and take on tasks that they're not qualified to actually perform. And, and this is a big issue with these thermal imaging uh, cameras that, that take people's temperatures. And uh, as I said earlier, you know, this, there's a far cry between uh, these thermal imaging cameras that are certified, that have um, 510K certification from the FDA, which you certainly can speak to, and the, the ha- a handheld type camera that you would, that you purchase in a five and dime and have employees uh, take their own sure. temperature with. And uh, that's why it's important to have, uh, you know, appropriate security consultants or people who have the expertise such as you do, to be able to examine uh, what it is that's being offered to the employer or to the workplace uh, so that appropriate uh, testing equipment uh, can be can be brought in because not all not all thermal imaging cameras are created uh, equally. Oh, that's true. I mean, and some of the some of the testing that we've done with uh, with some of the cameras uh, and it's just you're not getting the throughput that we, that you would need. First off, the camera doesn't you know isn't isn't all that accurate to begin with. You know, if you're looking at you know a half a degree either way or three quarters of a degree, and some of them are even more more than that. You know, and when you're looking at a specific point of 100.4, and now all of a sudden you know you got a camera that can shift in one degree in either direction. You know, it's what's the use of it? You well, know. that's the problem. There is there the use of it becomes futile. We were talking earlier about um, one of the companies that we're aware of, Flare Systems, who, that actually has a defense uh, background and uh, that has people from the defense department that are actually uh, principals in the in, in the company, and they have thermal infrared thermal imaging that works at a sophisticated level and that that can be calibrated to the environment. Not all the systems uh, do. Not all the systems are of the same quality, and that's not an endorsement for one system over another, but the, the point is that there are a lot of players out there in the field, and it's important for people to consult with consultants such as yourself who have the ability to be able to look at this and to be able to say, okay, we understand this, let us explain this to you so that you're in a position to be able to uh, make an adequate determination. Well, yeah, I mean, Jim, you, you, I know you got a – you got points on this. The how many times, and you know, we, again, we're going back to what I said in the opening, where ninety three, ninety, you know, with the 
with the bombings in the Trade Center and then the 9-11 attack, the technologies that came out and the rush to be able to bring technology to bear. And how many times today are we seeing, you know, when people are bringing us technologies to take a look at, how many of them are just being shoehorned in, right? You have an access control system and, you know, the, the, the big thing now is everybody wants to have, you know, facial recognition, temperature sensing, and right. access control all rolled into one. Um, the temperature sensing, the, the, that thermal imaging camera was never, was never conceived in the original designs. And now all of a sudden they're shoehorning stuff in. Well, you know, in the in the security industry, we talk about multi-factor authentication. You know, before COVID, uh, multi-factor was considered to be, you know, who you are, what you have, what you know, you know, to validate, you know, uh, your identity and your permission to get into a building and, you know, uh, whether it's through, you know, passcodes or PIN codes or whatnot in addition to your credentials and, you know, what have you. But, you know, we're really looking at another um, factor of authentication here to, to validate that, uh, that you're not ill. And the, the thing to, uh, to not uh, completely jump to is that that's the only factor to consider. We can't lose sight of the fact that uh, the security systems are necessary for, um, you know, making sure that the wrong people are not granted access, you know, into the building. Uh, when we add this other element, we got to be careful that it's just not a oh, you know, let's just let's just take your temperature and figuring that that's going to cover it. I think what we will see evolve here are a number of elements to the to the health factor that you know it would be best if that were uh, you know driven by guidelines from CDC or what have you. But it's 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 more than just temperature. Uh, it could very well be that you know we'll we'll evolve to the ability of taking other. Other uh, metrics, like they take when you're in the hospital, they take your blood pressure, they take your risk, you know, they look at your respiratory system, you look at your temperature. I mean, they take all these different, they look at all these different factors because together they're meaningful in an assessment of your health condition. Uh, we may we may evolve to the point where you know three or four of those factors you know merge together actually do catch you know ninety percent of those that are close to or showing. Uh, you know, symptoms at this point. But um, we're not there yet with what we have out there in the marketplace. The thing that, that, built, that business owners and, and, and building owners need to be uh, cognizant of is, is always remember why we're doing this and don't get, you know, mesmerized, you know, by, uh, you know, something that's claimed to be the, you know, the latest uh, one-shot technology. There's never a single technology that is a one size fits all. It's always an integration of a number of factors together that can reduce, you know, the what we call the nuisance alarm rate and the and the false alarm rate and, and make systems more accurate and then people trust it because, you know, when something, you know, is failing thirty to eighty percent of the time, it's just it's just optics. It's it's you know, it's there for, for public view, but it's really not performing a function. And come on, what's one of your favorite sayings? Because we can doesn't yes, mean we Yes, because should. you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. That's right. <laughs> well, that's largely why in some of the uh, the bigger office buildings you see the initial screenings going on now with the, with the temperature checking. And then when someone is found to have an elevated temperature, uh, best practices would be then to divert them to a secondary uh, screening with a competent medical professional. Right. Well, an even more optimal condition you know, situation is to be able to have mobile apps that enable people to to self test, right? Uh, to some degree, it's an honor system. As that matures, you know, we can maybe get more specific so that it's not just the honor system, uh, but have that pre screening to at least mitigate the number of people that you are bringing into that environment that are at risk of you know tripping the bell and showing some symptoms that are going to then cause a go no go problem. Because uh, that's not where you want the vetting happening, you know, is in the lobby of your building. Right. Well, there are pre-screening health questionnaires that um, that employees are being asked to complete before coming into the office each day, where they're asked about the various symptoms uh, of COVID-19, whether they have them or whether anyone in their household has, has them. The problem with some of those screening questionnaires is they ask questions, for example, have you experienced shortness of breath? Now, someone who's got um, COPD or asthma might always answer yes to that question mm -hmm. and then uh, theoretically be barred from the from the workplace and uh, you know for for an employer then to be put in the position of saying to the employee uh, is there some other basis for for why you're 
uh, you're saying this is impermissible because it's a medical inquiry. So uh, the, this this disease that we're dealing with now raises a whole host of issues that we've never had to to address before. Sounds good. Okay. We just want to take a couple of seconds again just to, to remind everybody that you're listening to the Risk Advisor podcast. Being hosted by Jim Henry and myself, Sal LaFrieri, we're going to invite you to comment on our blog at theriskadvisor.com and to subscribe and follow us on our social media like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you're interested in having one or both of us speak at an upcoming event or you'd like to consult with either of us or both of us, we're going to ask you to go to our webpage again, and that is theriskadvisor.com to set that up. As we get into the the final segment of the show, um, one of the things that I always like to do is talk about some solutions that um, that the listeners who are dealing with these issues uh, can contemplate and maybe actually put into use. And along that line, I think um, you know we should talk about some critical steps in handling COVID, uh, dealing with that situation in the workplace and. One of the first things you had mentioned, you said early on in pre-pro, was think strategically. Tell us right. a little about that. Well, look, employers need to uh, need to address the situation. They need to become familiar with the with the rules and regulations, and they're changing on uh, on a daily basis. And they have to to recognize that it's necessary to seek competent advice of professionals who are who are schooled in this area, whether that means legal counsel and understanding the uh, the rules and regulations and, uh, and and professionals such as yourself who deal with with security based and consulting issues that that 's very very important and then once the employers actually have taken that initial step, they need to make a determination as to what they 're going to do and communicate that to their st- to their staff so that well, the bef- employees before know. We get the communication let me just go yes. back one second the Large companies that have the opportunity to have an HR department, right? Um, you know, you can you can turn to your HR professional and and hopefully be guided by what they say. Although it's been my experience that um, HR has always has always seemed to bring up more questions than they have answers for. But that's just my own personal experience with them. But if you don't have, in the absence of HR, uh, and you're not a large company that has an in-house counsel. What's the best way for them to go? In terms of what? Trying Getting, to determine trying to, what to trying do? Trying to get the, the appropriate advice. Most companies have legal counsel, and most, most legal counsel can direct them whether uh, they have uh, someone who's an employment specialist such as myself or they, they work with people who are, have expertise in this area. You know, there are, there are numerous laws that are impacted by this virus. It's not just the safety protocols that are issued by the, the government. As we were discussing earlier, there are aspects of discrimination, there's confidentiality, there's, uh, there's a wage and hour. It, it, it goes on and on and on, and liability issues. And so that, that's why it's very important for people to seek uh, advice of professionals when they're moving forward. So for them not to go alone. Exactly. Read through the the uh, the, the government's website. Uh, you can read the, on the on the CDC, the Department of Health. Uh, the governor's uh, page gives gives very good information as a starting point. But you know, employers have an obligation to become familiar with all these different things, and and they should seek um, competent counsel when they're moving forward if there's something that they don't understand. And when I was cutting you off, you started to explain about communicating. Right. Employees should feel free to communicate with their uh, with their employer about concerns that they have. You know, as I said earlier, it's in everybody's interest for people to work together and to be work cooperatively, and and for uh, for the staff to be happy and for uh, for the economy to restart without having a backsliding. Uh, due to uh, an increase in the virus. So uh, that that's the hallmark of any employment situation, is that employers need to effectively communicate their policies and procedures to their employees. And if employees have questions or concerns, they should raise them with their employer, because most of the time, employers want to work cooperatively with their employees and, and have things run smoothly, because it serves everybody's interest. 
I, I would say that in addition to communicating persuasively, it'd be communicating consistently and repeatedly. Yes. Right? Another phrase I love is, you know, it's uh, the, the importance of communication. It's frequency, not amplitude. Right. Uh, and especially in this case, and especially with the backdrop, I mean, one, one benefit that employers have it would be hard for them to appear less competent than agencies like the WHO and the way that we started with this whole process where every day was, you know, a different, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, re retraction of a statement or a condition or what have you. So the employers have the headwind of uh, this being a very subjective uh, and indeterminate situation but they have the backdrop of n people knowing that they're they're trying to follow what is a moving target with right. with, with what the agencies are giving them. So, the all the more reason for repeated communications, even if something hasn't changed, communicate that it hasn't changed because that actually now is the exception <laughs> rather than the rule. Right. Where it seemed like the news, you know, when we were in in April and March and April, you know, was changing, you know, daily of do this, don't do this, wear the mask, don't wear the mask, blah, blah, blah. You know, it, 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 it's very challenging. So, you know, the, like I say, the employers have, a, you know, have a tough act to follow. Um, but I think if they are, you know, if they are very proactive and if they communicate consistently and not only, not only indicate what they're doing, but why they're doing it, uh, you know, is very important, which right. then takes us to the last bullet of when they do take an action is to act decisively. And, you know, can you elaborate on that? Right. Well, that goes to what to the communication point. If they've made a decision as to how they're going to proceed, they need to disseminate that information to their employees and, and stick to it. Right. If, if an employer is telling their employee, you must wear masks in the office because that's what the guidance says, it has to enforce that policy right, right. And, and make sure that employees are complying with the policy and employees who don't comply with the policy have to be addressed. Right. And if that, be, that becomes a really a disciplinary issue because the, the notion is we want everyone to work together to keep everybody everybody's safe. Right. As long as the employer is clearly indicating that that is a the condition of employment, and they are enforcing that equally across the board, they're on good footing. Well, it, you know, it's not only a condition of employment, it's a condition of daily life now. Because the governor has said everyone should be, should be wearing masks when they're in public. And when you're in an office setting, it's a quasi-public setting to the extent that you're not in your own individual office with a closed door. So everyone has the obligation to adhere to these uh, safety protocols that have been put into place. What about companies that bring in outside vendors and we see this a lot obviously in the security <laughs> industry mm -hmm. right what about the outside vendors that are that are brought in that are basically having control of the, it's their employees right that are, that are providing the service for your firm what kind of you know review policy protocol what how do you i'm stumbling through the question do they have <laughs> Is it a, is the owner of the company who brings in a security guard firm? Is he ultimately he or she ultimately responsible for ensuring that the protocols that that outsource service is providing is being maintained? When someone comes into the, into a workplace or any company, the the employer or the person who brings them in has a duty to enforce the safety rules. So. Uh, would would be in a position of saying you know uh, to the to the let's use an example someone comes in to fix the copy machine the 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 person who's fixing the copy machine should adhere to this to the same safety protocols that the employees are adhering to meaning they must wear a mask they must social distance the equipment has to be sanitized those sorts of things and separate and apart from it it's any of those other issues does the employee, does the owner of the company, is there anything they should be concerned about when they're hiring the security company and ensuring that that company has protocols in place? They certainly could, during the course of the uh, hiring process, say we want to be assured that, in fact, you adhere to all safety uh, protocols relative to COVID-19. And we're seeing that a lot of um, uh, contracts nowadays do have provisions that are being put in them. You know, as we said, this is impacting so many areas. It's not just employment law that this, this impacts. This, this cuts 
cuts across the board. A little thing like, uh, for example, somebody may have completed many years ago a do not resuscitate order, right, or a living will, saying that they don't want it, they don't want extraordinary means that might have included being put on a ventilator. Well, that might have applied in a situation where someone was, was uh, God forbid, in some sort of a, a deadly accident where they, they said that they did not want uh, to be in that situation. But perhaps now with the coronavirus, you, do, you don't want that in place because you, you want the, uh, the chance to be uh, ventilated and, and uh, survive. So those are all sorts of things that people, people, individuals have to consider, just an example of how... Uh, how things going forward are going to be changing. Cybersecurity is a big ish- issue now as people buy more things uh, online. So the, l- the list just goes on and on and on. Yeah, and I'm sure it's got to uh, overseas when you're dealing with, because now you're dealing with global issues. Right. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. right. Exactly right. Companies are restructuring. They're going out of business. These are, uh, you know, rent issues. People have been unable to pay their their rent. There's uh, commercial leasing issues. It's it, it's it's, uh, it's unending. Unfortunately, <laughs> speaking of ending, we have to end. On behalf of Jim and myself, thank you for doing this. We really appreciate you taking the time and coming in today and chatting with us. Uh, for those of you that are listening to this, the, on our website, we will have a uh, – in the show notes, we're going to have a video that we did, sort of a, an extended talk with Helen talking about some of the topics. And we invite you to go and download that and take a look at it and feed, give us some feedback on it and tell us what, uh, what you think. We'd like to say that you've been listening to the Risk Advisor podcast that's being hosted by Jim Henry and me, Sal LaFrieri. We'd like to ask you to subscribe to this show and like us on our social media sites like Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you're interested in having one or both of us to speak at an upcoming event or would like us to consult, please go to our webpage, theriskadvisor.com, and set that up. Also, if you happen to know someone that would make a great guest, please go to our webpage at theriskadvisor.com and make your suggestion to us. And remember that you can hear the show on your favorite podcast platform, You can add it at YouTube and, of course, stream it at theriskadvisor.com. Thanks again for listening, and we hope you tune in next week. And and I would just like to add in closing, of course, anything that we've said here today is not in the context of legal advice. Uh, We're happy to discuss these issues with you, but anyone who has questions on any of these areas should consult with their own counsel. Sounds good. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. TheRiskAdvisor.com. Save your most important documents and photos in the cloud. A Microsoft 365 subscription gives you a full terabyte of secure OneDrive storage, plus an added layer of protection with OneDrive Personal Vault. Buy now at Microsoft365.com slash photos. The in OLED display in the Cadillac Escalade has 38 total diagonal inches of color display. So why do we give it a curve, too? I guess you could say we like to bend the rules. The 2021 Cadillac Escalade. Never stop arriving.